A mysterious building sits on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Its colossal plazas once sparkled with the pageantry of a vanished people. Where now fish and scuba divers glide over its ramparts, priests, astronomers, sailors and kings from a forgotten epoch once walked. Before cataclysms of fire and flood engulfed this structure, it may have been the sacred center of mankind's original homeland. It may have been the Temple of Moon. As an officer in the British Occupation Army of India, Colonel James Churchwood tirelessly assisted with famine relief during the 1870s. He was befriended by a grateful native holy man. Churchwood was shown a collection of clay tablets covered with mysterious inscriptions. The elderly priest taught the Englishman how to read the strange writing. It told of humanity's earliest civilization on a vanished land in the Pacific Ocean called Mu. Here, the arts and sciences were born, and a religion of compassion and spiritual empowerment originated. The civilization of Mu spread widely as missionaries brought their gentle faith to the outposts of the ancient world. Churchwood's account of the Pacific Ocean Empire was rejected by scientists of his day. Only now is his vision of mankind's motherland beginning to materialize in underwater discoveries made around Japan. The story begins thousands of years ago. An immense land in the Pacific Ocean was overwhelmed by storms of volcanic violence. This was the Empire of Mu. 100-foot high waves crashed over the world's first civilization, dragging most of its terrified inhabitants to the bottom of the sea. Mu sank into a watery void leaving behind the Pacific Islands as sole testimony to its lost grandeur. The Egyptians believed their ancestors survived from the catastrophe, which they memorialized in this symbol from their Book of the Dead. According to Churchwood, the outer rectangle represents the borders of Mu itself. The inner rectangle signifies that the motherland has sunk into a watery abyss. Sword-like flames surrounding the rectangle stand for the fires which encircled Mu when it sank and show why mankind has not been able to return to paradise. The strange story of Mu has been almost universally condemned by scholars as fantasy. But new underwater finds strongly suggest some of the remnants may have been discovered around the southernmost territories of Japan. These are the Ryukyu Islands, of which Okinawa is the best known. Okinawa means floating rope, a name that seems to describe the whole Ryukyu chain. Less famous is the smaller island of Yonaguni. Here, at a place called Iseki Point, divers examine the ancient ruins of a sunken civilization. Descending to 30 meters in the crystal clear waters, they fight treacherous currents. Braving danger, they are astounded to come upon an immense ceremonial center. What powerful forces brought it to the bottom of the sea? How old is it? Who were the people that made it? How did they use it? What became of them? Can this be the drowned temple of Mu? Yonaguni's subsurface discovery brings to life the legendary Ryu Gujo, the sunken castle of Japanese myth. In this old folk tale, a turtle brings the hero Urashima Taro to the underwater kingdom as reward for an act of kindness. Although subjected to thousands of years of erosion from encrusting marine life and strong currents, the structure still bears many traces of its man-made identity including tool marks and deliberate celestial alignments. Like the Great Sphinx of ancient Egypt, it may have been terraformed. In other words, an original natural formation was shaped into a sacred center by human beings during ancient times. There are strange rectangular columns set together like colossal books. Surrounding the underwater structure's enormous base, is a loop road with encircling man-made drainage ditch. There are massive curved walls, beautifully formed entranceways, flanked by finely cut and positioned blocks. Great steps, 
a long, narrow channel. Large, deep holes that once braced construction hoists. The stylistic sculpture of turtles. A huge boulder mysteriously perched upon its own platform. site may have belonged to an enigma described by Colonel Churchwood in his 1924 book, The Lost Continent of Mu. He told of man's evolutionary leap to civilization, signified by the image of a deer springing upon the tea glyph, symbolizing the land of Mu. In evidence, Churchwood pointed out that ancient Egyptians, Mesopotamians, and Asians regarded their ancestral motherland as lying in the east on the other side of the world. Prehistoric Europeans and Native Americans believed it was in the West. In between lay the continent of Mu, from which the emissaries of civilization spread around the globe. Professor of Ancient Languages, Dr. James Hurtak, points out that surprising linguistic ties did indeed connect distantly separated peoples in the deep past, just as Churchwood wrote. We see, for example, in the work of Churchwood, who popularized the concept of Mu, the reality of a mother continent, a motherland that he derived from the word Ma, that there was once a large continent that encompassed many diverse cultures with their respective symbols and language phonetic systems. In fact, we are told in the earlier Japanese sutras, the sacred text of the East, that the first 36 emperors of Japan descended from the sun, and the very first emperors were named Jimmu or Kinmu, suggesting that the name Mu was highly significant for an ancient culture, an ancient primordial place where the solar light or the solar rays were brought to Earth, shared with the Japanese people. We are also told in the Indian Hindu text of the Ramayana that the Nakals or the teachers of the East brought their symbols to Burma from a land of birth and the land that we recognize was recognized by the ancients as Mu, someplace situated in Asia. We have thus many interesting historic places that reference a parent culture that had a language connecting all languages. A widely scattered memory of the lost continent is preserved among otherwise disparate cultures, often separated by enormous distances. In Mexico, the Mayans claimed that their ancestors arrived from the western motherland before it was swallowed by the sea in a great firestorm. James Churchwood claimed that the Pacific civilization went so far as to influence the ancient Greek alphabet. According to him, Reciting the Greek alphabet in sequence actually tells the story of Mu. Heavily break the waters over the plains. They cover the low places. Where there are objections, shores form. The earth is struck with water. The waters spread on all that live and move. The foundations give way, and submerged is the land of Mu. Churchwood also believed that the language of Mu was the parent tongue of Mayan speech, or Mayaks, and ancient Egyptian. He claimed that missionaries from Mu traveled to the Yucatan and to the Nile Delta, where they sparked Mesoamerican and Pharaonic civilizations, leaving their mark in the many word parallels found in either language. During his years in India, Churchwood was taught how to interpret esoteric symbols on the clay tablets which detailed the civilization of Mu. For example, a snake coiled round its clutch of eggs was, in his own words, the waters of the mother of life. The image of a deer standing on its hind legs stood for an act of emergence the birthplace of man in a civilized society.
Churchwood's Mu appears to have left traces of its former existence in the waters around the Ryukyu Islands. Their capital, Okinawa, is itself rich with ancient history. Here, karate was first developed in Japan. It grew out of the Okinawans' need for self-defense after all weapons were banned around the 15th century. It is recorded in 1818 when Napoleon Bonaparte was told that the Okinawans never carried arms of any type. He replied in amazement, you mean they really carry no weapons of any kind? I cannot understand a people not interested in war. The martial artist's policy of never striking the first blow exemplifies the peaceful disposition of the Okinawans, a characteristic they share with their ancestors in the lost continent. The inhabitants of Mu were said to have been a people more interested in the arts of culture and religion than war. In sharp contrast to virtually every other society since then, including our own, Mu did not support a military class. No tales of conquest or foreign aggression are associated with the correctly named Pacific Civilization. Its long fluorescence represented the early golden age of human society. Like these karate students, the people of Mu were devotees of spiritual self-discipline. They developed and practiced a religion which left its enduring influences as far afield as North American Indian shamanism and Tibetan Buddhism with their gentle piety, commitment to peaceful conduct and devotion to spiritual growth. Okinawa features many examples of traditional sacred architecture with roots in the deep past. The true origins of these structures are unknown and they differ from shrines and temples on the larger Japanese islands in the north. Nakagosuku's powerful sloping walls, sinuous ramparts, massive stairways and towering bulwarks are strangely suggestive of the stone structure lying under the sea near Yonaguni. Dr. Masaaki Kimura, professor of earth science and geophysics at Okinawa's University of the Ryukyus. He is widely regarded as a world-class expert in seismology and marine geology. So his conclusions regarding the ancient origins of Yonaguni's underwater site are authoritative and revealing. Dr. Kimura visits the Okinawa Prefecture Museum to examine a piece of the archaeological puzzle. Like its Nile Valley counterpart that helped translate the ancient Egyptian language, the so-called Okinawa Rosetta Stone is thought to contain information that could demystify the island's prehistory. Dr. Kimura is interested in personally examining the inscribed stone because he believes it might refer to the subsurface ruin near Yonaguni. For the last 20 years, he has studied various ancient symbols of Asia in his efforts to decipher similar stone tablets found throughout Okinawa. This carved stone is extremely interesting. There are many symbols and representations. I'd like you to look at this. This here is a boat. There are many things written everywhere. This represents the shape of people. It's like the Japanese character for people anyway. It represents people. Here in this spot is a boat, and in the center there is a line which goes down to the bottom. This represents the boundary between the sea and the land. This is the land, this is the sea. On the other side is the boat. On the other side of the stone, in this area, symbols of people have been carved. In between there is a line, and this line represents the shoreline between the sea and land. So in that sea area, this is the back of the stone we saw previously, a spectacular house like this has been carved. This stone is broken, but on another stone, a stairway is carved. So it's saying if we climb the staircase on a high spot is this style of house, and this house is in the middle of the sea. This is starting to appear similar to the underwater structures of Yonaguni. Returning to his students at the university, Dr. Kimura shares with them his conclusions about the underwater site near Yonaguni. 
Some of the young people have assisted him in field work there. Look at this section here. This has been hit from the top once, twice, three times to get this type of point. So placing it like this, it can be used as a drill or awl. According to Dr. Kimura, a landmass that became the Ryukyu Islands was torn away from the Chinese mainland by tectonic forces over the course of several million years. In this geological process, occasionally violent seismic events suddenly submerged large tracts of land. Before their destruction, some of these unstable areas may have been inhabited by a powerful society based on the exceptionally fertile volcanic soil, hence the story of Mu. But is there any hard scientific evidence that territories among the Ryukyu Islands have gone down into the sea? An answer might be found in Okinawa's numerous caves. Some were used as places of refuge by ancient man. Members of the Jomon culture in ancient Japan created the oldest known pottery in the world more than 12,000 years ago. Many caves contain enormous limestone formations resembling fantastic sculpture. These gigantic pillars of naturally molded stone were created by the evaporation of water dripping with carbonate of lime. The calcium deposits collected gradually but steadily over thousands of years grew into the bizarre shapes that feature the spaces of Okinawa's subterranean sites. Such a slow accumulation process can only take place on land. Divers go over the side in search of a cave some 50 meters underwater off the northwest coast of Okinawa. The sunken site is rumored to be a small rock shelter used by human inhabitants many thousands of years ago. If so, it could confirm that the Ryukyu Islands have indeed experienced geologic submergence during their early occupation by man. Cave dives at these depths are always dangerous operations. Equipment malfunction or diver disorientation can end in tragedy. The water is crystal clear, but pitch black. Lamp failure here could lead to panic and drowning of divers with anything less than nerves of steel. Yet the deeper they plunge into the lightless abyss, the deeper they descend into the past. There are other dangers down here, the entrance to the cave is patrolled by this poisonous lionfish. Its spiny fins are deadly. But the divers press on. Their descent lit by special xenon underwater lights. They brilliantly illuminate the otherwise impenetrable darkness. The divers are astounded to find a huge cavern. Like monstrous fangs in its great mouth, Stalactites and stalagmites extend from roof and floor. To have formed, the site had to have been above water for many thousands of years. Its mere existence proves that long established areas of the Ryukyu Islands have indeed sunk into the sea. The site helps to place Yonaguni's sunken structure at Iseki Point within the realm of geophysical possibility. Like Okinawa's drowned cavern, it too has been engulfed by the sea. But Dr. Kimura points out that a continent as large as the one described by Churchwood could not have existed in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Modern oceanography tells us that the seafloor there offers no evidence for such a huge landmass. Instead, he offers an alternate location for the lost motherland. <laughs> There is talk of the land of Mu and a Pacific Ocean utopia. I think it becomes a possibility if we consider that the Ryukyu Islands may have been home to that utopia. It was not only Churchwood who had ideas about a utopia in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. In the 1800s, a man called Newgraf also had similar ideas about a large continent in the middle of the Pacific. We looked at these theories and investigated geologically where this would most likely be located. 
There was never a land of Mu in the middle of the Pacific where Churchwood said it was. If it was anywhere, it was most likely to have been in this area. Our investigation takes us to San Diego, California, the home of the Scripps Oceanographic Institute, part of the University of California. Scripps has its own research ships and regularly carries out undersea surveys throughout the world. Professor David Sandwell has been part of the Scripps research effort for many years to map the depths of the world's oceans. As a professor of earth science, he has compiled computer simulations which show that a continent of the kind described by James Churchwood could not have existed in the Central Pacific. Starting here over North America, out in space, um, and we're flying around a globe. This hole here on the top of the Earth is where we don't have any data. Um, now we're flying down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge from the north to the south. Um, you can see that the ridge axis here is, is shallower than the normal seafloor depth, and that's due to the cooling and subsidence of the lithosphere as it ages. But this is occurring on a 30 to 50 million year time scale, much geologic time. Okay, now we're down in the South Atlantic, going along the ridge axis, and soon we'll be coming up into the Indian Ocean. Uh, over here on our left is Africa, Antarctica is on the right. We're coming up to a place called the Indian Ocean Triple Junction, where three tectonic plates meet. We've got the Antarctic plate, the African plate, and the Asian plate. Like Professor Kimura, Dr. Sandwell can find no geological evidence for the land of Mu in the Central Pacific. He points instead to an undersea area west of China in the vicinity of Japan, where conditions are more favorable for the former existence of a lost continent. First of all, out in the Pacific here, things are pretty quiescent on these time scales, and so it's not possible out in the deep ocean, but as you get closer to the places where the plates are subducting, you have subduction zones, you have large earthquakes. During an earthquake, you could have the land shift up and down by, say, 10 meters, and that would be enough to drown some exposed areas. Professor Sandwell's conclusion that the western rather than the central Pacific Ocean was the likely location of Moo has been supported by Oxford professor Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer. In his abundantly researched book, Eden in the East, he demonstrates that several cataclysmic floods, including the one cited in the Old Testament, forced the ancient aboriginals from their continental homeland, dispersing them throughout the ancient world. The reason I um, felt, felt the need to write Eden in the East was because uh, uh, I thought that the conventional view of the origins of uh, um, Polynesians uh, was wrong and that uh, the view which this conventional theory has of uh, Southeast Asia as being a hunter-gatherer society up until 4,000 years ago was also wrong. I believe that they were already planting root crops and uh, using uh, a number of different kinds of trees uh, to support uh, a sedentary lifestyle, um, and that this preceded um, this, this wave which is supposed to have come out of uh, uh, Taiwan 4,000 years ago. The sunken continent of Southeast Asia is about twice the size of India and includes Thailand, Malaysia, the South China Sea, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, and all the sea between those islands. So it was a, a large continent there were three rapid sea level rises which occurred after the last ice age, one around 14,000 years ago, another around 11,500 years ago, and the last, much more recently, uh, around 8,000 years ago. And each of these gobbled up a little bit more land. Well, there were various solutions to this rapid sea level rise. One is to move inland to higher land, to mountainous land, and Obviously, there was some of that left over in, in Southeast Asia. Um, the other is, is simply to get in your boats and leave to somewhere which isn't being flooded. And I believe that that uh, is, is, is what some of these people did. The next stage of our investigation takes us to Australia and its capital, Canberra, 
the home of the Australian National University. For the past 20 years, space scientist turned Earth scientist, Professor Kurt Lambeck, has been studying how sea level changes have affected the Earth throughout its history. Professor Lambeck agrees that a Pacific motherland probably existed, but cannot accept that it could have sunk overnight. A lot of the legends seem to condense events into very short periods of time. The creation of the Earth in seven days, the uh, destruction of Atlantis. So I'm not sure that one should necessarily believe that these events do occur on very short time periods. It's quite conceivable that what is being recorded or what is being remembered is a collective memory of events that occurred over a longer period of time. But having said that, in the Pacific, things may happen on more rapid time scales. The island of Yonaguni sits at the margin of the Pacific and the Asian plates. This is where the uh, Pacific crust is being pushed underneath the mainland, and it's an area where a lot of tectonic stress builds up. The little I have seen of the constructions that are now below sea level are certainly very convincing. Uh, and either as a quarry or part of the foundations of building, clearly people were there constructing or carving these things out of rock. And this is not, uh, they weren't doing this below sea level. So clearly the sea has flooded the area either because of, as part of the global sea level rise, in which case we can give some estimates of when this could have occurred, and this would have to be of the order of 12, 13, 14,000 years ago, I suspect, or it has to be seen as part of the tectonic history of the area, where in more recent times there has been a local tectonic subsidence which caused these islands to disappear below the sea. investigative focus concentrates on Yonaguni, Japan's most westerly landfall. Izeki Point, site of the sunken mystery, lies in the open sea. Here are suggested the old legends of Horai, a banished kingdom sought out for its magical herb. Today's small island of some 1,500 residents formerly covered broader territories long since gone beneath the Pacific Ocean or it may have been part of an even larger landmass, perhaps the lost continent of Mu. The residents of Yonaguni are today a happy, hard-working, long-lived people. They are nourished by the bounty of the sea and the fertile soil of their island, much as the people of Mu prospered more than 12,000 years ago, perhaps in this very part of the world. If so, then the Ryukyu Islanders may be descended from inhabitants of the ancient Pacific motherland. Okinawa's ancient association with Mo resurfaced in 1995. At that time, the director of the World Health Organization acknowledged Okinawa as a world longevity region. The Okinawans have the longest verified lifespan in the world as evidenced by the 25-year landmark study in the Okinawa program. Cancer, heart disease and stroke are relatively infrequent among them. Their traditionally low-calorie diet and abundance of life-extending herbs combine to provide the Okinawans with a longevity denied most other peoples. On the cliffs of Yonaguni, Professor Kimura's students search for telltale traces of ancient masonry activity which might be connected to the great stone structure lying in the sea nearby. Appropriately, wedge-shaped cutting implements known as kusabi, common throughout the Ryukyus, have been found here. They may be the same tools used by the builders of the underwater structure. In fact, its walls still bear marks made by workers employing kusabi stone cutters. Researchers along Yonaguni's coastal areas have also found what appears to be evidence for stone quarrying in the distant past. The marks of such activity are clearly defined and contribute to our understanding of the Izeki Point site as an undeniably man-made feature. Near the tool marks facing due east, 
we come upon strange carvings. They may form an ancient Phoenician inscription. Dr. Hertak explains. If this is a proto-Phoenician script, it's very interesting because we have in the letters going from my right to left, in the first symbol, the ancient symbol for Tzadi, or for fishhook, a place of importance, of attachment, the second, ayin, which is the eye, the third and the fourth are yod marks for the arms that are raised, and finally, again, the symbol for ayin, or the eye. Thus, the eyes with the upraised hands facing east behold the sun. This could indeed be an ancient reference point in navigational language to the rising of the sun or some type of ceremonial marking even amongst the Proto-Phoenician people or even the Polynesian people for entertainment and worship of the sun. In his 1973 Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch, Dr. Hertak stated that in the region of approximately 121 degrees east longitude, ancient temples and pyramids would be found, linking the Yonaguni area to Egypt's pyramids, Cambodia's Angkor Wat, and other sacred sites throughout the world. According to Dr. Hertak, the Yonaguni area locates one region where ancient civilization reached significant development. Revelations such as these force us to reconsider our origins as a civilized species because they suggest the existence of a global culture long before the supposed rise of civilization in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. Okinawan legends tell of godlike voyagers who arrived long ago from the west. After a time, they departed but eventually returned with a valuable gift, the knowledge of rice cultivation. This ancient stone circle and column commemorate the site where the mysterious visitors came ashore. A few hundred yards away, an old shrine erected in honor of their agricultural gift is still venerated after countless generations. Even today, Many Okinawans express their gratitude in pilgrimage and prayer to the semi-divine personages. But their native legend may be a reflection of actual events which occurred about 2,000 years ago. Ancient Chinese historical texts document a voyage of exploration in search of Horai. On this island, the Qin Emperor believed the plant of immortality could be found. Accordingly, he dispatched an expedition of several thousand men and women under the leadership of Master Jufuku. The Okinawan and Chinese legends combine in this bronze bell examined by Professor Kimura at the Prefectural Museum. It was cast at the command of a 15th century emperor to signify Okinawa's identification as the island of Horai with its sought after plant of immortality an underwater expedition to investigate the monument in the seas around Yonaguni. The team is made up of commercial divers, who often work on rescue missions, and professional underwater cameramen, experienced in working at problematical sites like this one. Currents are dangerous, and sometimes sharks cruise by. But water clarity is excellent, with visibility at 60 meters and more. The conditions are ideal for photographing locations as large as Iseki Point. Although the top portions lie only a few meters beneath the surface, the base goes down some 33 meters. The structure measures approximately 140 by 200 meters. This is approximately the size of a 60-story building lying on its side. Broad terraces call to mind pyramid-shaped sites from South America. Gargantuan stairs climb to higher levels, while divers marvel at the eerie ruins glowing in the faded emerald light. 
。そうですね。あの南西諸島のいろいろ海底遺跡のようなものがあるんですが、あの人工的。There are various underwater ruins in the Nansei Islands, but the Yonaguni Island ruins are the only ruins which have been proved to be man-made. These ruins are called Iseki Point. I think that Iseki Point was possibly a palace. We could say a castle of the gods or something very similar. Comparatively, the top section of Iseki Point looks like a quarry area. Encircling Iseki Point, there's something like a loop road. There are also walls made of stones. There is also an entrance. This leads us to hypothesize that Iseki Point was built for a cultural purpose and was not used as a mere quarry. As part of his research, Professor Kimura has overseen a survey of the Iseki Point site. What emerged? was a remarkable comparison of the underwater structure with a famous edifice on land. Shuri Castle, Okinawa's most revered and best known building, severely damaged during World War II, was recently restored to its original grandeur. The castle is dated to the mid 15th century, but the style of the stone foundations and many of its architectural details go back much further to the island's prehistory. Its resemblance to Yonaguni's underwater ruin becomes clear when we compare the ground plans of both sites. Their structural relationship even extends to shared measurements. Iseki Point's credibility as a man-made structure benefits from its similarities with Shuri Castle. Divers descending to the base of Iseki Point discovered a kind of loop road encircling the base of the structure. Adjacent to the road is a channel identified as a man-made drainage ditch. On Okinawa, a similar stoneway, complete with drainage ditch, surrounds the perimeter of Shuri Castle. Skeptics convinced that Yonaguni's underwater site is nothing more than a natural formation are hard pressed to explain these similarities. The divers continue their survey of Yonaguni's sunken structure. The precision of its right angle layout clearly defines it as man-made and not the work of natural forces. Its grandeur is on a scale with similar building achievements in other parts of the ancient world. It compares with the architecture of the Egyptians, Incas, Babylonians, or Imperial Chinese. The colossal dimensions of these forms imply a civilized people skilled in truly monumental stonework. A clue to their construction techniques are these large holes at the top of the site. Too large for the accommodation of house posts, they must have served some other purpose, perhaps building props, working as primitive cranes for the hoisting or lowering of giant blocks. Dr. Kimura sought out the expert opinion of one of Japan's top stonemasons, Kotaro Maja. Mr. Maja, who led the restoration of Shuri Castle, agreed that the use of such props for building construction was common in ancient times. Comparisons between the sunken ruin and Shuri Castle do not end in similar construction and ground plans, as Dr. Kimura explains. Here are two dragon columns. They're a few meters in height from the ground. They're called dragon poles. On top of Iseki Point, there are two turtles facing each other. The type of animal is different, but there is one on each side, and each one of them represents a water god. As you can see, this dragon over here has its mouth open, and this one's mouth is closed. The turtles of Yonaguni are similar. One's neck is extended. The other's neck is retracted. There are two turtles with different stances facing each other. I think one similarity is the poses, but moreover is the fact that they have been placed in the most important area of the temple. I think the similarity lies in this. We recall the folk tale of a turtle that led a young fisherman down to a sunken castle. The turtle is symbolic throughout Asia for longevity. The turtles at Iseki Point, representing longevity, combine wonderfully with a miraculous plant grown in Yonaguni, known as the long life herb. This is Cho Mei Usa.
It flourishes in a small area of the Ryukyu Islands, but nowhere else on Earth. The unique nature of the soil here is said to be responsible for its restricted growth. More importantly, Chomeigusa has been widely regarded by the islanders for unknown generations as the secret of a healthy, long life. In fact, islanders who reside near the growing area of Chomeigusa enjoy the longest, most physically productive lifespan in the world. Mr. Toge, a local nurseryman, has had the plant tested and is beginning to market this remarkable long life herb. Basically, Chomei Gusa is a naturally growing plant. It grows well in many climates. In areas close to the sea with salty wind or drought, it has a great capacity for survival. From ancient times, people have thought that Chomei Gusa had special properties. The Yonaguni Chomei Gusa is a darker colour, the leaves are thicker, and therefore it has more nutrients than other Chomei Gusa. If we refer to the chemical analysis of the long-life herb, compared to other vegetables and herbs, it has many minerals and vitamins. Even in the Okinawa area, or even in Ishigaki Island, it is called the same name, Chomei Gusa. From now on, I think if people mix Chomei Gusa with their food, they'll enjoy a long life. In the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, a hero searches across the sea for the plant of immortality, which he can only find with the help of the survivor from a great flood. Was Chomei Gusa the plant of immortality sought for in Mu? Dr. Kimura. <laughs> I have a great interest in this. This grass or herb called Chomei Gusa is all over Okinawa and the southern part of the Nansei Islands. The people of the Qin dynasty of China sent a high priest named Jofuku here. They went to the island of Horai. The medicinal herbs they saw were like kinoko mushrooms called monkey saddle. In the story, they wrote that they saw mushrooms, but the Chinese characters for grass or lawn was written rather than the character for mushrooms. So why did so many people look for Horai? They were looking for a long-life herb. They believed if they went to this island, this land, they would find a nutritionally powerful herb. I think that this land must have been where the Ryukyu or Nansei Islands are now. The sunken ruin at Yonaguni features additional overseas connections, such as this massive boulder set upon its own platform. In faraway Central America, Similar huge stones were set apart by an unknown race for purposes we still do not understand. Our dive master peers into the eyes of a colossal head which eerily resembles those on Easter Island. Appropriately, it faces east in the direction of the rising sun which symbolized the creator to the people of Mu. The legends of Easter Island tell us that it was settled by survivors from a great flood. The Andes Mountains of Peru feature their own comparisons. Shared relationships not suspected by even its native peoples. Just outside Cusco, Peru, the ruins seem strangely reminiscent of faraway Japan's sunken enigma. Are resemblances purely coincidental? Yonaguni's underwater structure was fashioned by its ancient builders from native rock into gargantuan steps fit for the gods to climb. The same architectural style appears at nearby Kenko. This prehistoric ceremonial center lies just outside Cusco. But more than similar construction techniques suggest Japanese counterpart. Both sites are decorated with animal sculptures. Kenko's eroded image of two birds facing each other 
are similar to Yonaguni's turtles and Shuri Castle's two dragon columns. In both cultures, animals signified sacred concepts. Machu Picchu was the holy city of the Incas, hidden among the Andes Mountains. The ceremonial center was occupied by the chosen women, the Achiacuna, who were entrusted with the science and history of Inca civilization. They told how a royal family, fleeing for their lives from some terrible cataclysm, found a sanctuary in Peru. Here, they introduced the high arts and technology of their drowned homeland. The Achacuna have their counterpart in Okinawa, known as the Noro, who were the shamanic priestesses and advisors to the king. With its precise arrangement of cut stone, Yonaguni's underwater structure is identical to South American construction. Peru's monumental constructions are mirror images of their Ryukyu Island sunken citadel. Their shared resemblance confirms an inter-Pacific connection between Japan and South America in the ancient past. Another intriguing parallel occurs among the natural boulders set up on their own pedestals by the builders at both Yonaguni and Peru. Close comparison of otherwise unique building styles as distantly separated Machu Picchu and Yonaguni strongly suggests that both sites independently inherited a common legacy from some outside source. Could that civilization have been the lost kingdom of Mu? Yonaguni's carved writing, perhaps Phoenician, may eventually answer that question. Machu Picchu's hitching post of the sun is one more cross-cultural clue. Ceremonial steps rise towards heaven, the abode of the sun god. The ceremonial centers, 100 feet beneath the sea at Yonaguni and 13,000 feet high in the Andes Mountains of Peru, were built by descendants of the same people, culture bearers from the lost lands of Mu. Those survivors from a great natural catastrophe left behind their enduring legacy on both sides of the Pacific. The sacred character of the similar structures still speaks of a shared heritage. They are lasting testimony to the cultural power of a vanished people. Yonaguni's submerged monument may be a revealing link to ancient connections with South America. From Peru, throughout the Pacific Islands, all the way to Japan, evidence does indeed survive in legends, religion, and even the physical remains of a vanished culture. The recurrence of the name, Mu, throughout Polynesia is surviving evidence for the lost continent. Dr. Kimura believes that this drowned civilization has been known under various names in the past, such as Horai, Haiviki, and Lemuria, but the lost continent is best known as Mu, by the man who wrote most about it, James Churchwood. Churchwood was the most well-known of people who talked about the land of Mu, which he thought to be somewhere in the Pacific. If we verify this historically, looking at various cultural records, the land of Mu in fact fits our Japanese description of Horai. In fact, Shinno Shikate, with thousands and thousands of people, was sent from China to look for the land of Horai. There are various tales like that. In my opinion, the land of Mu is the same as Horai. So where is this place, Horai? This is the same as looking for the land of Mu. I'm beginning to postulate that the underwater ruins equal the ruins of Horai. The underwater ruin at Yonaguni is the first evidence for Churchwood's Pacific civilization. It was said to have been the cradle of mankind, the birthplace of science and spirituality, the very home of the gods, where alone on earth the plant of immortality grew. The cataclysm that overwhelmed this empire obliterated all but their dimmest memory. The island of Yonaguni is a mere speck in the Pacific. 
but it may not have always been so. The chain of Ryukyu Islands, of which Yonaguni is a part, may once have formed one large landmass where man first learned the arts of civilization. In the 12,000 years since its destruction, nothing so far remains except one of its monumental feats of sacred architecture, its uppermost features lying just a few meters beneath the sea. This lost world was said to have flourished for more than 70,000 years. Something conventional scientists, who believe human civilization is just 5,000 years old, are unable to grasp. But it is also difficult to understand how an ancient stone temple came to rest under 30 meters of Pacific Ocean in the middle of nowhere. If the drowned feature is not a remnant of Mu, then what is it? Professor Kimura's academic standing as an extraordinary geologist has lent much needed credibility to the Yonaguni structure's archaeological identity. His research efforts on behalf of the sunken anomaly have persuaded the Japanese authorities to declare it a legitimate historical site. It continues to be the focus of Iris de Mauro and her research team as they bring its mysteries to the attention of the outside world. They are united in their quest for conclusive answers about the undersea enigma so reminiscent of the drowned castle in Japanese folk tales. But sometimes stories long dismissed as fiction turn out to be true. A case in point was James Churchward's insistence that Mu was the location of the original Garden of Eden mentioned in the Bible. Critics condemned this as ludicrous, even blasphemous. But in the Garden of Eden, the scriptures report, stood the tree of life, and whoever ate of its fruit would gain immortality. Through advanced techniques of DNA analysis, Dr. Oppenheimer's 20 years research in Southeast Asia now confirms some very old genetic markers he calls Adam's genes and Eve's genes being traced to this region. This genetic evidence supports at least one major group of ancient peoples migrating from the Borneo area to Europe and the Pacific during the last ice age. This contradicts the currently held view of dispersion originating from continental Asia. When I say Adam's genes or Eve genes, it's, it's really a shorthand for two types of genes which are only passed down through our parents. One which comes down through our mothers, and the other which comes down through our fathers. The advantages of, these, of studying these two genes is that they don't get mixed up at each generation. The rest of our genes, which is more than 99%, is mixed up and shuffled at every generation, which makes it very difficult to trace the spread of people. But if we look at the Adam and Eve genes, which don't mix, they give us a very clear picture of human spread uh, around the world. The present view of the origins of the Polynesians, the present establishment view, is that they came as rice farmers from Taiwan who spread into uh, Southeast Asia and then out to the Pacific. The problem is that uh, the Polynesians never grew any rice, and they do not share the uh, same genes as the Taiwanese Aborigines that they're uh, argued to have come from. It is perhaps no coincidence that only the Ryukyu Islands grow a plant known as the long-life herb, Cho Megusa, which does contribute to human life extension. And it appears that this may have been one of the valuable plants for which the Chinese dispatched thousands of men and women 20 centuries ago to find. They believe it flourished only on Horai, the legendary island and Cho Megusa combine with the biblical Garden of Eden's Tree of Immortality to place Mu in the vicinity of Yonaguni's sunken structure. Professional investigators like Kimura, Hurtak, Sandwell, Lambeck and Oppenheimer agree that the Central Pacific was not the location of Mu. Like Colonel James Churchwood who preceded them, each researcher holds a piece of the archaeological puzzle. A real-life image of Mu is beginning to emerge as the scattered evidence they find is being brought together for the first time. Part of the evidence is the many Pacific area native legends which recount that the sunken civilization was a peaceful society. 
Its people were devoted to the feminine energies of harmony and peace. A lesson for our present day world of continual war. Despite their dedication to spirituality, however, Mu died with the last ice age in a cataclysm of flood and flame. The time has come for us to revive the memory of that legendary golden age of peace. The more we discover about that lost age, the better we may understand ourselves, for we are the children of Moon.